Mars rover just captured something nobody expected, a glowing tic-tac-shaped object streaking across the red planet sky, and it's being called 3i Atlas. It's an interstellar object heading towards Earth, and the images are unlike anything NASA has ever released. Some things in space are predictable. Comets are not one of them, but even by their wild standards, what 3i Atlas did near Mars was a nightmare scenario. This interstellar traveler didn't just surprise astronomers, it triggered a NASA red alert that put every single asset on the red planet at risk. The change was so bizarre, so powerful, that the initial data was flagged as an error. But it wasn't an error. It was real. And the most shocking fact is, the math suggests this wasn't a random event. The thing nobody tells you is what the trajectory change was pointing towards. Red alert at JPL. At 2.13 in the morning, Pacific Time, a single red flag appeared on the Jet Propulsion Laboratory's mission dashboard. You see, these systems are designed to be calm. They track thousands of variables, and most deviations get a gentle yellow warning. But the system had just caught a 3.2% orbital deviation in 3i Atlas's Mars flyby data. The outlier was so enormous, so far beyond any expected error margin, that the automated alert skipped yellow and jumped straight to a full-blown crisis warning. The most shocking fact is that the software running these checks was designed by some of the world's top physicists, and it had never, not once in its operational history, issued an alert of this magnitude for a cometary flyby. Within minutes, the night shift engineers, who were halfway through routine system checks, were scrambling. The control room, usually a place of quiet, focused confidence, turned tense. Phones lit up, slack pings echoed off the walls. The lead trajectory analyst, still in sneakers from a midnight coffee run, was suddenly fielding calls from the Planetary Defense Coordination Office, Mars Operations, and the top floor directors. Every screen was filled with live telemetry from the Deep Space Network and cascading error logs. The thing nobody tells you about these moments is the silence that falls between the frantic calls. It's the silence where everyone realizes the playbook might not apply anymore. The deviation had been confirmed by two independent observatories, one in Japan, one in Spain, within the hour. The data was cross-referenced with observations from the powerful Subaru telescope in Hawaii, which saw the same impossible shift. Now the question wasn't whether the data was real, but how much worse it was about to get. By 2.30 a.m., the escalation protocol kicked in. The on-call planetary defense coordinator authorized a full-scale emergency teleconference. What many overlooked in the initial chaos was the sheer speed of the event. The comet's trajectory hadn't drifted, it had snapped to a new path in a window of just a few hours. NASA's Planetary Defense Office, ESA's navigation team, and JAXA's Deep Space Specialists all logged on. The agenda was brutally simple. Find out if the deviation pointed to a catastrophic outburst of the comet, a massive solar event they had somehow missed, or something else entirely, something they hadn't even thought to model. To put it mildly, the third option was what kept everyone awake. The call ran for eight straight hours, a record for any JPL anomaly response. Arguments broke out over whether Mars assets, the rovers and orbiters worth billions of dollars, needed to be put into immediate safe mode. The fear wasn't just a direct impact. A cometary outburst could create a debris field traveling at thousands of miles per hour, a cosmic shotgun blast aimed right at our robotic fleet. Slack channels overflowed with command line dumps, error codes, and hastily redacted screenshots of sensitive data. The phrase, unprecedented event, appeared in three separate internal memos before sunrise. One log entry, timestamped at 3.07 a.m., simply read, deviation confirmed, no model fits. Awaiting further guidance. As the sun rose over Pasadena, the exhausted night crew realized they had triggered the largest planetary defense scramble since the Chelyabinsk meteor event in 2013. The only certainty was that 3i Atlas had just rewritten the rules, but the shift in its path was only the beginning of the nightmare. A Comet Without Water Across the Atlantic, the European Space Agency's navigation lab was already crunching the numbers before the sun even hit their offices in Germany. Their sophisticated models, built on decades of tracking comets, slammed into a brick wall. None of them could explain the sudden 1.5 magnitude spike in 3i Atlas's brightness. This wasn't a slow, graceful brightening as it got closer to the sun. This was a cosmic flare-up, 
tripling the comet's optical output in under four hours. It was like a dim bulb suddenly shining with the intensity of a searchlight. But not all things are what they seem. The real shock came from the spectrographs. These instruments break down the light from an object, revealing its chemical composition. They flagged a cyanogen emission line at 388 nanometers that was twice as strong as anything seen from previous interstellar visitors like Oumuamua or Borisov. Even the Japanese team at the National Astronomical Observatory using the Subaru telescope confirmed the exact same spectral fingerprint. Three independent agencies, three matching anomalies. The data was undeniable. Photometric logs from the Hubble Space Telescope and, ironically, the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter showed the object's light curve veering far outside predicted bounds. This forced a full recalibration of the comet's basic properties. ESA's analysts, who are usually very conservative, revised the nucleus size upward by nearly 30 percent. That meant 3i Atlas could be several miles across, not the modest rocky snowball they first imagined. A body that massive would require an unimaginable amount of force to push it off course. At the same time, the cyanogen line strength raised terrifying new questions. You see, in normal comets, cyanogen emissions track along with water and carbon monoxide. It's a key signature that tells you what's boiling off as sunlight hits the surface ice. But here's the crazy part. The water vapor signature was barely there and carbon monoxide was missing entirely. What was left was a plume of pure cyanogen gas so intense that ESA's lead spectroscopist called it chemically impossible in an internal memo that later leaked. The numbers weren't just odd, they broke the known rules of comet chemistry. It was like finding smoke without any evidence of a fire. Meanwhile, the Global Minor Planet Center updated its orbital elements database four times in 12 hours, a rate unheard of for a single object. Each revision tried to tighten the uncertainty cone around the comet's path, but the residuals, the tiny errors between prediction and reality, stubbornly refused to shrink. JPL's own covariance matrix, a complex mathematical tool to gauge confidence in an orbit, ballooned into a sprawling table of chaos. The numbers were screaming that they didn't know where this thing was truly going. Every agency ran their own frantic simulations. Some tried to model a massive directional outgassing event. Others factored in hypothetical solar wind surges. None could reproduce the observed 3.2% deviation or explain why the object's brightness and chemistry jumped in perfect unison. The mystery was deepening and the debate was about to get heated. The 6.2 miles per second problem. The search for answers split the scientific community almost overnight. Many people are crazy about finding simple explanations, and on one side, respected planetary scientists like Dr. Michelle Bannister stuck to the classic playbook. They pointed to outgassing, jets of vapor erupting from the comet's sunlit side. In theory, a big enough outburst could act like a small rocket engine nudging a comet off course. But the numbers just didn't add up. To put it mildly, it wasn't even close. Standard models show that even the wildest, most energetic comet jets barely manage a change in velocity of a few feet per second. The 3 I Atlas deviation, however, required a change of nearly 6 miles per second. That's a mind-boggling figure. It's the kind of thrust you'd need to launch a deep space probe from Earth, not what you'd expect from a dirty snowball venting a little gas. Solar physicists weighed in with a different idea a coronal mass ejection, or CME, slamming into the comet at just the right angle. CMEs can pack a punch, sometimes blasting charged particles out at over 4 million miles per hour. But when you run the math, the physics barrier is hard to ignore. Even the strongest solar storm in recorded history, the Carrington event of 1859, would have barely tickled an object as massive as 3i Atlas. To move something several miles wide by six miles per second, you'd need a solar event so extreme it would have fried satellites across the entire solar system. Nothing remotely like that showed up in space weather logs during the flyby window. And you can see this everywhere in the data, a gaping hole where a cause should be. This is where the debate turned into a scientific firestorm. Dr. Bannister and her colleagues argued for caution. They warned that the data set was new, the chemistry was weird, and the models could be missing something subtle about interstellar objects. Yet a smaller but highly vocal group saw these gaps as a sign of something stranger. 
Avi Loeb, the controversial Harvard astrophysicist known for his theories about Oumuamua, published a calculation that sent ripples through the community. The change in velocity needed to shift 3I Atlas from its original Mars flyby path to a potential Earth-crossing trajectory was surprisingly small in cosmic terms, just that six miles per second figure. It's a number that is not out of reach for active artificial propulsion. Loeb and his colleague Adam Hibbert, an expert in orbital dynamics, floated the chilling possibility that if you wanted to steer an object toward a planet, this is exactly the kind of maneuver you'd expect to see. They stopped short of claiming it was an alien probe, but their papers laid out the cold, hard math for anyone to follow. The combination of a pure cyanogen plume, a potential byproduct of exotic propulsion, the missing water vapor, and the impossible trajectory change was, in their view, too convenient to be a coincidence. NASA and the ESA officially dismissed these claims, but the split was real. Was this a one-in-a-billion natural event, or was something else at play? Freedom of Information NASA's internal review began before the anomaly had even faded from their dashboards. The thing nobody tells you is that in the wake of a crisis, the first priority is often controlling the narrative. By the next morning, the agency's legal team was already fielding a flood of Freedom of Information Act requests. They came from journalists at major newspapers, transparency watchdogs, and even UFO research groups, all demanding the raw trajectory logs, the spectrograph data, and transcripts of those frantic emergency calls. The first responses that came back were, to put it mildly, a cause for suspicion. Entire pages were blacked out with thick, dark lines. The redactions were heaviest where internal debates over the nature of the object or commands sent to the Mars missions appeared. This predictable move only poured gasoline on the fire of public speculation. Screenshots of the redacted memos went viral. On platforms like Reddit and X, users were analyzing the documents like forensic evidence tallying up the missing lines and guessing what terrifying possibilities might be hidden underneath. The official explanation cited ongoing security review and the need to protect sensitive operational details. But for many, the blackout looked less like caution and more like a cover-up. Inside the agency, the after-action review ballooned into a massive cross-agency affair. The Planetary Defense Coordination Office, usually a low-profile team, found itself briefing not just NASA leadership, but also the White House's Office of Science and Technology Policy and committees at the Pentagon. What many overlooked was the political fallout. Proposals for new deep space monitoring satellites and enhanced radar networks landed on congressional desks within days. The event had created a sense of urgency not seen since the Cold War. Defense contractors, always quick to spot an opportunity, started pushing for billion-dollar upgrades to orbital warning systems, arguing that the current network had been caught completely flat-footed by an interstellar wildcard. On Capitol Hill, the gears of government ground into panicked circles. Budget committees convened emergency hearings, a piece of political theater where lawmakers demanded answers that no one possessed. Behind the closed doors, their own staffers confessed in hushed tones the terrifying absurdity of their task. There was no line item, no conceivable appropriation for defending against an anomaly that could rewrite its own trajectory. The entire architecture of national security was built to counter terrestrial threats, not a variable that defied celestial mechanics. Pressure mounted from the outside. Watchdog groups and transparency advocates, still bitter over the frustratingly opaque handling of the Oumuamua flyby, flooded congressional inboxes and organized campaigns demanding the immediate, unfiltered release of all telemetry data. In response, NASA's Public Affairs Office, masters of bland reassurance, promised unprecedented openness while delivering the opposite. Every update was a masterpiece of bureaucratic obfuscation, carefully engineered to quell the very alarm that was consuming the agency from within. This public-facing calm belied the ferocious debate raging through secure video conferences and classified white papers. The foundational question was no longer scientific but philosophical, a terrifying ethical quandary. What is the protocol for a discovery that could shatter economies, religions, and the very concept of human sovereignty? To whom do you report a potential god or a potential extinction event? The result was a chilling institutional paralysis, a standoff between the duty to inform and the fear of the consequences.
The old playbooks for cosmic surprises weren't just obsolete, they were artifacts from a bygone era of innocence. Was this a random cosmic event, a warning, or a failed attempt at contact? Let us know your theory in the comments. Don't forget to like and subscribe for more answers to the universe's greatest mysteries.